Wait for a minute more. Um, what we heard after his speech or his session with us was that he had dil mange more in a way that can we have more, can we get into little more details. So extremely excited to uh, have SK with us and from his busy schedule he's kept one hour every day for the next four days barring the weekend uh, to come and spend time with all of us. So welcome once again and thank you for joining us in big numbers. SK over to you and I'm excited for once I miss being an engineer, so I'll try and learn something today. Thank Over you. to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, today. Uh, the worst time of the day to pr make a presentation is after lunch. Uh, but uh, I guess there's no other choice, and I'll try to make it, make it as entertaining as possible. Uh, Unlike economics, people say economics is the most boring subject. Uh, hopefully machine learning is not that. I'll talk about uh, certain aspects of machine learning today, uh, which would be a good starting point for you. But let me explain the whole logic of this four-day series of tutorials on machine learning. Uh, wherever I go in the world, wherever I get a chance to talk to people, I, I hear um, there seems to be a huge amount of gap between what people want to know and what people can know because of the availability of knowledge. And uh, machine learning is, is one such topic which everyone is talking about. And, and, and lots of lots of jobs available too. So if just in case, uh, if you guys are looking for to change a job, it will be a good opportunity for you to learn uh, new machine learning topics too. Um, uh, but, <laughs> sorry Alex sir. Uh, you know, you might have heard this uh, joke that's going around on, on Facebook and, and WhatsApp. Uh, a CEO and CFO talking to each other, and CEO is asking, uh, what if you train all of these people and leave? Uh, they, they leave the company. And, and the CFO says, what if you don't train them and they don't go? It's a dangerous situation too, but I would rather prefer a situation where this is a free world and you are well trained, well equipped with solving the problems in the world, and you would stay in this company or not, that would be your free volition. But I guess uh, your managers and the management of this company would be providing challenging opportunities for you to actually work on it. Mm, I don't know if I told you this example or not. Uh, I'm going to stand on the stage now. Um, I've been given instructions by the gentleman here to stand somewhere on this side only, right? Yeah, that's where it is. Uh, I can't move that side. So people sitting on that side, I can't even look at you because uh, he looked, he told me not to look at you. Uh, no, he said to stand around here so that he can cover both the frames, uh, the, the screen and, and myself. I don't know, I told you this story last time or not. There's a, a famous uh, company called Zappos. Did you talk about the company Zappos last, uh, last time? Um, uh, there's a, a, uh, the, one of the first online companies in the United States, which actually was uh, started with the intention of selling shoes, online shoes. That too, women's shoes. I don't know how many of you actually accompanied a, a, a female family member of yours to actually do uh, shoe shopping. Uh, it's not an easy task. Uh, that's because uh, uh, I like the passion, that's why it is. Uh, not for any other reason. If I tell this to my wife, I think she'll get really upset. And she, I always say, no, no, I like the passion, that's why I, I'm amazed. This company called Zappo started with the intention of selling online shoes for women and everyone thought it's going, to be, it's going to be a failure company. But that's one of the few companies which reached revenues from zero dollars to a billion dollars in less than 10 years. Many tech companies don't do, do that uh, accomplishment in 10 years, but this non-tech activity. So the, the, the founder wrote a book uh, on how they did it and many of the uh, curious admirers asked the question, are, are you sure you want to reveal about how you achieved this uh, spectacular uh, achievement by writing a book because people are going to copy that ideas. He said, I'm not scared about copying the ideas but because the, you can't copy the culture of the organization. So I guess uh, people like uh, Alok and Navneet and, and your respective managers are creating the culture of learning and I want all of you to learn, be constantly learning. Uh, I was just telling someone in the morning today, there's a great uh, uh, wise man in the world called Warren Buffett. Have you heard of him? He apparently reads 500 pages every week. 
whether it's uh, reports, books, newspapers, magazines, all put together, 500 pages a week. How many pages do you guys read? Okay, never mind. I'm going to be talking about an introductory topic today in machine learning about the availability of various frameworks that you can use to develop machine learning solutions. The today's session and of course next three days session will be such topics, on such topics which will be sort of an introductory topic for you guys. We'll give you a flavor of what various machine learning topics are. It would give you a good start to understand machine learning. Uh, there is a, a discussion, which I will not get into today. There is a discussion on what is AI, what is machine learning, what is deep learning. But if you don't know the answer, I want you to go back and find out the answers. I think it's not a difficult thing. Please find out what's the difference between AI, machine learning, and deep learning. Today I'm going to be talking about frameworks, that is the libraries available, uh, open sourced by companies for people like you to develop solutions. Now before I get into actual frameworks itself, I want to talk about one of the many, many accomplishments in machine learning or deep learning. There's a paper published, I think, a couple of years ago, 2016, I guess. It's called Style, Trans Style Transfer Neural Network. It takes two distinct images, combines those two images into a single image, gives you entirely different look. For example, if you take the image of, let's say, a, a, a city view, multiple buildings, and then take a Van Gogh painting, you would have heard of Van Gogh? then this neural network, style transfer neural network, actually creates another painting-looking image, which is entirely a new creation, created by a machine. And have you seen the examples of this implementation in any of the apps you may be using? All of those uh, uh, Instagram and other applications you have where you have those funny like horns coming out of your head and, and, and things. That's nothing else but a style transfer neural network, a smaller size style transfer neural network sitting on your mobile device creating new images for you. This, you know, 150 lines of code. How many of you are software engineers, programmers, who actually can write code? 150 lines of code would be what? Half an hour job for you? Let's say half a day job for you. But having said that, before I get into further into uh, machine learning, uh, five years ago, ten years ago, when productivity was a major metric to be measured in software companies, uh, people used to measure productivity. And do you know that what's the productivity in, let's say, C language for an average programmer? Paravar, how many lines? How many? Five lines? Anyone doesn't like his answer? Five lines per hour? Actually, three lines. You're, you're, you're quite right. It's three lines uh, uh, of code per hour. But the reason why it looks so small is you don't count the effort you spend on requirements management, designing, peer reviews, and all of that stuff, too. But typically, the lines of code is only five lines, uh, three, three to five lines uh, of uh, C language uh, per hour. In that context, 150 lines of Keras code is very, very simple to develop such a, a spectacular looking application machine learning. So let's, let's talk about machine learning frameworks. Again, when I say a framework, framework is a, a set of libraries that are made available by these companies as open source uh, tools that you can use to write a, 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 a machine learning solution. Now, I can bring the importance or highlight the importance of these frameworks with an example. A couple of years ago, four years ago, when you write a machine learning solution, uh, there is a, a technique or a, or a concept called backpropagation. When you're doing a neural, ne neural network, when you're training the neural network, you actually feed the data from the left to the right, 
and then once the solution comes out, the, the tentative solution comes out on the right side, you actually have to back propagate the derivative of this solution for all the weights to the back and that's called back propagation. To implement a back propagation four years ago, it used to be at least 50 to 100 lines of code, it used to be very complicated code. Today or even 2017, even 2016, if you have to write a machine learning solution, you don't have to write a single line of code for back propagation. So what was available in 2015 versus what's available in 2016, even 2017, every year there are giant leaps being taken in creating my, my machine learning solutions. In 2011, 2012, Apple, companies like Apple was anxiously trying to develop machine learning based solutions for uh, um, sentiment analysis on what people are thinking about a company like Apple, for example. It used to be a huge product. Companies like Apple used to even ready, be ready to spend millions of dollars to develop a product. Today, to write a sentiment analysis application using a, a machine learning or a low-end classical machine learning solution would be as simple as 20 to 25 lines of code. 20 or 25 lines of code. Or if you want to write a little more deep neural network-based solution for some, uh, sentiment analysis for a massive data set would be 400, 500 lines of code, which could be just maybe a week's uh, effort. So just f five, six years ago to today, the, the, amount of the, the, the amount of effort that's been gone into creating these frameworks and making your life easy to create ML solutions is amazing. So if you have heard of some of these frameworks and if you have not some of the, heard of some of these frameworks, that's nothing to be worried about because there are so many other frameworks which I have not heard of it too. Many of these frameworks are open sourced and I'm going to talk about some of these frameworks in the rest of the slides. And if you have any questions, please raise your hands uh, at any point of time. These are some of the popular frameworks. Uh, I put a, a bunch of related frameworks into a single bullet called TensorFlow, TensorFlow Lite, TF Learn, TF Layers, TensorFlow, Tensor Layer, TF Slim, TF Contrib Learn, Pretty Tensor, Sonnet, all are outputs or variations of TensorFlow. Actually, majority of them are created by Google. Some are created by third-party companies, but many of them are actually created by Tens uh, Google. There is a joke, internal joke in Google that maybe within the company they couldn't agree on a single framework, so they were just creating multiple types of frameworks. Of course, many of these frameworks actually work on GPUs and CPUs or on the cloud, but there are some frameworks which actually work on a, on a, on a mobile device, like a drone or a surveillance camera. Uh, so TensorFlow is, is a product of uh, Google, they've op open sourced it for, for a long time now. Uh, when I say long time, the draft version of TensorFlow was available since 2016 maybe. Uh, the first official version 1.0 was released in Jan Feb of 2017, just a little more than a year ago. And I'll talk about that a little more. Uh, Amazon came out with a new framework or a service called SageMaker, I'm going to talk about that too. Uh, CNTK, Microsoft has uh, um, a framework called CNTK 2.0. Uh, Microsoft has another uh, deep learning uh, framework called DMTK. CAFE 2 is another framework which is actually quite popular. Uh, CAFE 2 is a, a successor of CAFE, which was a previous version, uh, previous uh, framework available. We'll talk about that too. H2O is a company and also it's a platform available. It's a, it's a, fro it's a for profit company but they have an open source this framework which is easily available. Uh, uh, some other frameworks too, you have Microsoft Azure, Microsoft uh, um, uh, Machine Learning Studio. If you guys, any of you, if you don't know anything about machine learning and if you're not very comfortable doing programming or if you don't want to learn Python anymore and if you hate programming and if you still want to learn machine learning in the process, you may want to check the Microsoft Azure Machine Learning Studio. It's a drag and drop type of a framework which works like a flow chart. You pick the data set, you pick the model, you pick the parameters, more of a, a drag and drop, start connecting with this, and at the end it starts giving you the results. The most easy way of learning machine learning. But then there are anything that's like more of a shortcut for learning machine learning. 
but remember whenever you do a shortcuts for many things you will miss out on the the fundamental concepts and i'll talk about that in a minute uh, spark ml lib is another uh, a popular framework that's coming up really fast it does not have enough capability today but it is popular for one reason and i'll talk about that uh, in a minute too Tiano is one of the earliest frameworks that has been released i think maybe i think 2010 ish uh, by if i remember correctly university of montreal i think yeah um but tiano is now almost dead because the developers of tiano have officially announced that they will not be making any more contributions to tiano actually tensorflow is based on tiano you have deep learning 4j keras keras is one of the most popular framework available as comparable to, uh, as good as tensorflow and I, i'll talk about that in a minute paddle actually the framework is called paddle paddle twice paddle uh, by baidu it came out maybe around 6 months ago apache mahout veles ml pack 2 pytorch neon neon is a, a product of intel uh, intel has released a new framework uh, they actually bought a startup company called neon and they call the product 2 as neon now um, it just come out just less than 6 months ago marvin apache singa there are so many other frameworks available too i'll i'll talk about a few at the end of this presentation today i will be making a few recommendations in terms of what type of framework you can start working on if you are let's say a beginner or an intermediate skill person or an advanced machine learning person i'll talk about those uh, those this framework what you may be interested in just to give a insight into how frameworks are evolving constantly this is a research done between 2015 to 2016 there are such reports available for uh, 2011 12 15 16 i haven't seen reports yet for the 2017 i'm sure someone is going to publish soon about how various frameworks work If you look into just on a month to month basis TensorFlow has been picking up a lot of momentum from 2015 or 2016 2015 is when the draft versions was available um Theano was a, a strong player but I think now it's it's it, it's almost dying but if if you look into this graph uh, the the message is TensorFlow is really really picking up of course Cafe is not too far away but this is actually more of cafe but cafe 2 came out uh, in 2016 uh things are changing on these frameworks so constantly 6 months from now if i have to make the same presentation i'll be making a lot of changes to my slides but for a beginner for a, or a, for an intermediate level person if you want to pick machine learning up to learn machine learning some of the frameworks are stable enough for you to start working on and i'll give some uh, suggestions and advices in that regard this slide i made with an intention to make recommendations for a company or for individuals for example what factors you want to really consider before you pick a, a, a framework if you are a company you want to decide between am i going to be using machine learning purely or deep learning remember and at the start of the presentation i suggested that you should go find out the answer for deep learning and and uh, difference between machine learning and deep learning uh you want to find out whether the framework really helps you with the cpus and gpus uh also if you have data pipelines coming in if you have a huge amount of data that's streaming in let's say you are a factory and you have a, a huge number of turbines pipes pumps uh working and they are constantly churning its outputs and you're getting lots of sensor data from these machines if you have such a data pipeline or let's say you are a, a media company or if you are a company which wants to find out what the the common people are thinking like through social media you have another data pipeline that's coming in and if you have such type data requirements what would be those frameworks which you going to want to use cost of ownership all the frameworks are free but eventually when you start training when you start understanding when you start deploying it the cost of training cost of understanding cost of owning it's going to be it, it start accumulating and you want to understand what is the final cost of ownership documentation we software engineers are not good in documenting do you believe in that 
when we do the project, the moment we, while doing project, we always say, oh, let's finish the project and we can always update the requirements documents and design documents later. Once the project is over, everyone forgets. Same is the case for frameworks too. Many, many frameworks have atrocious documentation. And I'll talk about that. Hope no one is video recording except that gentleman there, because I'm going to make a few comments on, on Google uh, product documentation too. Uh, tutorials. If you are a beginner or an intermediate person, you need to have lots and lots of tutorials and you want to find out which frameworks provides that. Training, trained personnel available, community of uh, people who are committing uh, changes or uh, answering questions in, in websites like Quora, for example, and any other uh, factors that matter for the company. If you are an individual user, if, if you fall into any of these three categories, if you are a beginner, these are the factors you want to be really focusing on. Do you have good documentation? Do you have good tutorials? And how can I learn faster? Do I have lots of examples? Okay, so let's start with TensorFlow. Till now, you guys have any questions? Um, again, I don't know if this lunch is coming into effect or not, but, uh, uh, but hopefully, hopefully you guys have any questions. TensorFlow is one of the earliest if not like comparable to Theano, one of the earliest framework that's been there, sponsored by Google. Because of the sheer muscle power of Google, this product has been adding capabilities, adding APIs fast enough. I remember in 2016, when the draft version of, uh, of TensorFlow was available, many of the neural network solutions being published in papers, those were being implemented as is in TensorFlow. So even 2016, the style transfer paper I showed you today, if you wanted to implement that in a very, very short time using APIs provided, TensorFlow would have been the only framework you could have used to actually implement that. Uh, any other spectacular changes, for example, in text processing, uh, in tomorrow uh, session I'll be talking about text summarization. How, how if you give a bunch of text to the neural network, how does it summarize into a shorter text? Such type of text summarization solutions that have been implemented or suggested in 2016 and 17 are implemented in, in TensorFlow. Uh, TensorFlow actually performs really well. It actually is quite portable too. It actually goes, uh, uh, implements machine, machine learning and neural network based solutions, performs uh, and scales well. Um, it has a lot more models which are based on neural networks, that is deep learning. I haven't seen any other framework, at least six months ago, till six months ago or even a year ago, which has so many implementations of deep neural network in, in a single framework. So if you want to use neural networks, I think TensorFlow would be a good one to start with. Uh, with very, very minor tweaks, you can implement the same code on a CPU and also on a GPU. And you may want, if you don't know the difference between a CPU and a GPU in terms of what does a GPU bring to the table, you may want to read up on that too, because GPUs actually are slower in terms of the cycle, cycle times. But CP, GPUs bring in a tremendously different value, which, which enhances the speed of computing a neural network uh, 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 from, compared to a CPU from, let's say, one to 100 times. Uh, but also, it has an excellent, the entire application supports Python, even though a lot of APIs are implemented in C++ and, uh, and Java too, but it, it gives a very excellent support to, to Python. Documentation. TensorFlow does not have good documentation. If you have to read up on the information, you are better off going to Quora.com, StackOverflow.com to find out about what's happening in TensorFlow. A lot of people have answered questions. Of course, there are a lot of blogs available now to explain some of the APIs available in TensorFlow, but Google itself is not paying enough attention. I actually spoke to a gentleman, I think, a year ago about why that's the case. They said, we have two versions of TensorFlow. One is for internal consumption, one for external consumption. Obviously, the internal consumption is one version ahead of what the market sees. And they do have a decent documentation on those internal consumption, and as and when they are ready to create a newer version for internal consumption, 
then they would release the older versions documentation to the public and hence it's always uh, slow and somehow I think they're not really paying attention to the documentation part of it. So if you're not able to understand any of the APIs in TensorFlow, don't be surprised, uh, be, don't be surprised because that, that's, maybe that's how they've made it uh, uh, to, to not, not to have enough documentation. One of the fantastic things of machine learning is some, you, you just can't understand what's happening in some situations, you can't understand what's happening in, in the neural network. How the model is picking up certain data and how some, the model is picking up some features. I'll give an example. There was a neural network based recommendation engine which was recommending jobs for prospective candidates. After some time, people found the model was suggesting C-level jobs, the CEO, CFO type of jobs, the model was recommending only for men and not for women, even though they were equally qualified women available. Now, the reason for that is if you give the historical data where there were lots and lots of more men being hired for those roles and very few women hired for that role, even though the model creators never told the model that gender is a criteria, model thought gender is a criteria in this case. Because the fundamental premise of your neural network is it actually picks up features from the data which a regular human being cannot even see. That's the beauty of neural network. And that's what you want the neural network to pick up from. But sometimes if you unknowingly give the wrong data, it starts picking up the wrong features which you don't want to. That aspect of the neural networks, which sometimes you can't even explain. There is a new area of study in the last six months called explainable machine learning. Because people are looking for explanations for why the machine learning model or the neural network model is behaving the way it is behaving. Especially after the GDPR regulations from Europe and certain security violations in certain companies, people are scared, sometimes people are scared of believing what the neural network is suggesting. Especially in the healthcare situation where the patient's health could be dramatically affected if you have a wrong model predicting or making suggestions. So for, for that ex situation, you want to visually see how the model is constantly learning, how the model is evolving, and how the data is being consumed. TensorBoard as a feature in, in, uh, in Tensor, uh, TensorFlow would give a fantastic visualization of the model development. So at any point of time, after you gave the data, you designed a neural network of multiple layers and multiple neurons, and you are letting the model train epoch after epoch data, you want to visually see how the model is learning. To just to give a, an example of what do you mean by learning, let's say you have a deep neural network and you're training the model on trying to recognize animal pictures, let's say you have a cats and dogs. And if you have a multi-layer neural network, let's say a five-layer, seven-layer, ten-layer neural network, let's call the layer one as the first layer which sees the raw data that's coming in, and then you have layer two, three, four, five, and then let's say seventh layer. Seventh layer is called fully connected layer, and after that you do a, a softmax, that's a typical machine learning term, you should check what it is. And then the model is making a prediction whether it's a cat or a dog. And if you start giving maybe a few hundreds or maybe a few thousand of images to the model, layer by layer, the neural network is looking at the image and then trying to understand in its own way. So the first layer looks at the raw image and sends that interpretation to the second layer so the second layer looks at the interpretation of the first layer and then understands something more and then sends it to the third layer with its own interpretation. So at every layer, the model is trying to understand something or the other. Some machine learning experts actually wanted to look at what exactly did the model learn 
in layer 2, layer 3, layer 4. There are pictures available. What they found is, let's say if you give an image of a cat or a dog, layer 2, you would start seeing simple lines, which are nothing else but curves or edges, edges of an ear, edges of a nose, edges of a tail. And third layer, fourth layer, then you actually start seeing the curves or the, the, the smart skin shapes of, let's say, the ear, half-formed ear, half-formed nose, even colors. So every layer is learning something or the other. And that, that capability of a neural network is being used in a, in a different context called transfer learning where you can take one neural network trained on certain images, take the same model and give it to uh, a, a different neural network which actually is trying to look at, let's say, images of aircraft or cars. And they can, you can still train based on the previous knowledge. But the point I'm trying to make here is, if you have a good visualization of what's happening in the model, it would be a good understanding for you guys too when you're developing a model. Uh, there are a lot of tutorials available now, um, and the constantly Google is adding tutorials constantly, so you should be able to understand this better too. And they, they, it's very easy to run it on a CPU and a GPU, uh, 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 and also you can easily run a, run a mobile device um, uh, with using TensorFlow. Many companies have adopted it, and uh, it's. Uh, TensorFlow works on uh, many of the operating systems available. One of the best frameworks, if you're looking for, in my opinion, is TensorFlow. SageMaker has been introduced by Amazon just a couple of, maybe I think around six months ago, eight months ago. Um, it, they develop solutions for you if you have a problem statement. They would use any operating system. They would use any cloud service. They will use any mic uh, machine learning framework. So I would not call it as actually as a, as a framework, but it's more of a service. And if you should read it also, Amazon, when they announced for the first time, they said SageMaker is a service, machine learning as a service. But if you develop a machine learning solution in, let's say, TensorFlow, and if you want to implement it in, in Cafe, you can use SageMaker to transfer it and see how it works there. Cafe 2 is a successor of Cafe. Uh, the versatile framework that helps you on the image processing models. If you are developing any type of static images or video images, and if you want to develop neural network model for a uh, neural network model for you, you should use uh, Cafe 2. Quite expressive. In a single flag, you can train on a CPU or a GPU. Uh, it can process around 60 million images per day in a single NVIDIA K40 GPU. There's a very good, strongly supported community. If you look into the academic uh, organizations and research organizations, I've been working a lot on, on image, image processing. Uh, other than the numeric processing in machine learning, the most commonly, uh, the most number of research papers being published are in image processing. Uh, any type of uh, 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 static images and videos being published. It also supports multiple uh, operating systems. It, it has uh, uh, deep learning solutions in C++. One of the good features of Cafe 2 is called Model Zoo. Let's say you want to develop a new machine learning solution for, uh, uh, for this office where you want to find out every time an employee comes in, instead of flashing a badge, this camera can detect who you are and then opens the door or not open the door. Yeah, whatever it is. You don't have to develop a model right from scratch. You can actually look at some of the pre-existing models being trained on, let's say, people on the street, and someone has actually trained an image processing model and open sourced it. So there are lots of open sourced pre-trained image processing models available. It's called Model Zoo. You can look at the best model what you want, download it, and with limited amount of data, you can train your model, which can help you detect whether someone is an employee or not. So if you want to do a machine learning project on your own, convince your manager to say, we are going to develop a machine learning face detection model, which will replace your badges. How about that? If Navneet says no, don't give my name to him. 
It also has uh, Python and MATLAB interfaces, uh, Cafe 2. Um, anyone working on image processing problem statements, I would recommend you to start using Cafe 2. Even though TensorFlow is equally capable, capable in using, uh, creating uh, image processing based models, but Cafe 2 would be really, really uh, uh, easy to use, especially the model zoo. PyTorch. PyTorch is a successor of Torch. Torch was a famous framework that's being used in the academic circles. Uh, PyTorch is nothing else but Torch with a Python wrapper around it. Uh, even now, PyTorch is famous among academic circles, uh, especially if you're trying to do some fundamental research, developing brand new applications in, in, in areas which not been solved yet, uh, people use PyTorch. I would not imagine people in industry like you guys are developing solutions for our industry consumption may be using PyTorch, but if you, if you are interested, you can look at PyTorch too. That's one of the stable models available. Torch was one of the most stable frameworks available, but after PyTorch came, which is around a year ago, um, there are some changes happening into the framework, but I think it's relatively stable. Um, even if you have heard machine learning as a word just one time, there's a very high probability that you would have heard of the term Keras too. Keras is the most popular framework available today, open source framework available. Quite an easy framework, very, very easy. It actually uses TensorFlow as its backend. So it, it's, if TensorFlow you think is really a versatile framework, Keras is, is actually digging into those capabilities of TensorFlow and giving you that uh, advantage. So it's very, very easy to write to. Um, I showed you the style transfer example on the, on the first slide. That's actually 150 lines of code. It's very, very easy. Keras is quite easy to understand. It's uh, even the layers you create in the neural network are shown as individual lines of code. Every time you say layer, 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 it's just creating multiple layers. So easy to understand and program too. So if you want to start learning uh, machine learning, Keras would be the first one. If, if it's not the Microsoft Azure ML Studio, I talked about the flowchart based, which is non-programming approach, but programming is okay for you, I think you should start with Keras. It allows fast experimentation, and it, it's very, very easy to use. And it works easily on CPUs and GPUs. Spark ML Lib. Spark is very late entrant to machine learning frameworks. It's, I think they introduced ML Lib, I think, a year and a half ago. Uh, when they introduced it, they, were, they only had a few classical machine learning solutions available in, in ML Lib. And now I think they're implementing some other deep learning solutions too. Uh, the USP of Spark ML Lib is it integrates very, very well with Spark. So if you are an organization which has been using Spark for streaming data, that high amount of high volume data that's coming in, Spark ML Lib would be a good starting point for you because as an organization, you'll be able to use the pipelines, data pipelines that's coming in. But the ML Lib framework itself is not very capable yet. Uh, you can read the bullets yourself. I think they're self-explanatory. Microsoft introduced CNTK and CNTK2 uh, almost two years ago. Um, there seems to be a confusing approach of Microsoft on which framework to pick. I've seen a couple of other frameworks, I think. I've heard them sponsoring or supporting. Um, I don't know how good these are, but these are... Um, nicely integrated with the cloud environment Microsoft is providing. So if you are a Microsoft house, or if you are a company using my, uh, Microsoft solutions, then CNTK, DNTK, uh, DMTK, and CNTK2 would be what you want to use. Even though there are some deep learning solutions implemented in that, but not really uh, uh, very capable. For example, sequence to sequence solution, which I'll talk tomorrow in the tech summarization, that is one of the earliest models available, let's say in 2014, maybe 2014 and 15. Um, that's been implemented, but there are so many other techniques that have come after, which I don't think has been implemented yet. Apache MXNet is, is another one um, which has been introduced. I don't have a, a strong opinion for this. It, it also looks and, and works very similar to TensorFlow. Um, it's an open source tool too. 
but they don't have as many deep learning solutions uh, uh, similar to TensorFlow. Scikit-learn is a very basic rudimentary application. If you have a classical machine learning based problem statements, and I'll give you a problem statement right away. There are 9,000 patients. For each patient, there are eight different data points. And those data points are the age, uh, all the patients are female patients, so age, uh, married or not, number of kids, prior history of diabetes in the family, and a couple of other data points for each patient. And the, uh, the label for each of the uh, cases, after five years, from the day the initial data was taken, after five, five years, will this patient get diabetes or not? So you have 9,000 patients, that's the data set you have, and you have to design and develop a machine learning solution that will start predicting who's going to get diabetes five years from today. That's a classical prediction model available uh, with, with a small data set of 9,000 uh, points. Scikit-learn would be one of the first frameworks you would start using it to develop such things. It's a very easy to learn, simple ones, been one of the earliest av available, I think defined by a university some time ago. They have a very good documentation, lots of examples on that. So you, if you want to learn something and, and, and learn, understand some of the concepts of machine learning, it'll be a good starting point for you guys too. Um, there's not too much of deep learning there, it's purely machine learning. There are two classical machine learning like SVM and decision forest and random forest and decision trees. Those sort of classical uh, machine learning solutions available. So TensorFlow, if you want to really go for the programming as through, uh, Microsoft ML, Azure ML Studio would be if you don't want to have a programming approach. Uh, but programming, a little bit of programming, but you don't want to go really deep into machine learning problem statements and you want to really play with some of the small data sets and simple problem statements, you would start with scikit-learn. Theano is one of the earliest frameworks available. As I mentioned earlier to you, TensorFlow actually is built on Theano. So they took one version of Theano and started developing on that. So uh, Theano and TensorFlow looks very, very similar, but it's almost dead now because they recently announced six months ago that they're not going to make any more updates to Theano. So if you want to learn something, new framework, don't try Theano. Here is an example of uh, deep learning frameworks. Uh, this is the number of GitHub star counts on, on number of star counts that has got for each of the framework. This is, I think, published in 2017. Uh, 16, I think, 2016. Um, among all other frameworks, I think TensorFlow still gets the largest number of stars from the user community. Uh, another type of research done in August 2016, just a comparison of how various frameworks uh, respond based on certain properties. Um, if you, you see Cafe, uh, Neon, TensorFlow, Theano, Torch, they, they, they use those. Torch, as I mentioned to you, the successor of Torch is PyTorch. Uh, the problem, one of the problems of Torch in those days, why it was not widely used, was it was using a language called Lua. So if you have to use Torch as a framework, you're forced to learn a new language called Lua, and that's one of the reasons why no one picked it up. And now Torch was reintroduced with a Python wrapper called PyTorch. This is some, some information. If you want more information about this, you can look at the uh, a link I've given at the bottom here on the screen. And there's another report about uh, the r rankings and ratings of various frameworks uh, in 2017. None of these rankings, uh, this is another set of report, none of these rankings and reports match with each other because they are done at different times of, 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 the, uh, of the time period and uh, uh, things are constantly evolving. Some of the frameworks are evolving so, so fast sometimes I think it's just not, not even possible to compare. Uh, this is an example of tensor, uh, tensor board, how it looks. For example, if you see, uh, uh, as the model trains, uh, if you pick one specific metric, how the metric is evolving, you can actually see visually. Um, there's another comparison. There's a lot of text on the screen, but you can go to this, to, to this 
link to find out more information. But I think here also, if you look into Keras, I think he's picking up really fast in terms of popularity. This is my last slide. If you really want to learn machine learning, and if you want to play with some small size data sets and a simple problems, even though you could start with ML Studio Azure ML Studio or Scikit-Learn, I would recommend you to start using with TensorFlow because TensorFlow actually cater to so many different expertise in people. Also caters to capabilities of a variety of problem statements in machine learning and deep learning. So start with TensorFlow if you, if, you, if you know a little bit of programming or if you don't know programming and if you really want to become a little more stronger programmer and also become an ML expert, I would still recommend you to start using uh, TensorFlow. You can use Keras on top. One reason I'm not very comfortable suggesting Keras would be the starting point is Keras is more of a one-level abstraction on top of TensorFlow. Once you start learning on Keras and if you really want to develop some sophisticated models, you will have to come down to TensorFlow and start using it. I would rather, if you, if you ever reach that stage, I would rather want you to start working with TensorFlow and not go to some other model, uh, some, other model uh, some other framework called Keras and then come to TensorFlow. But you never know, Keras may also constantly upgrade the solutions available and give you better features, but as of today, I would be more comfortable as a programmer to get into TensorFlow. Uh, TensorFlow and Cafe2 are equally popular. Cafe2 is more popular for image processing. So if you have image processing solutions, problem statements, you may want to start using Cafe2. <coughs> um, TensorFlow and Cafe2 both are also good for mobile devices and use Spark. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're using Spark, use MLLib for your machine learning. That's all I had for today for frameworks. Now, the objective of me picking up this topic today is if you start working on understanding machine learning, the best way of understanding machine learning is to start solving some problems. If you don't know, oh, I don't even know what to work on, send me an email. I can recommend a couple of problem statements and go look for how to find a solution for that. Now. One of the problems of doing the fundamental, simple level machine learning problems is lots and lots of people have already solved the, those problems and posted or open sourced those, those, their code online. If you are trying to learn machine learning, don't look at those solutions because then you will not learn anything. Struggle yourself to find a solution. But when it comes to a corporate level problem statement where you are trying to solve a machine learning problem, in, let's say, in image processing, you would never start anything from scratch. You would actually pick an existing solution available open source and then start developing it. But if you are learning something for the first time and if you think you need to understand what machine learning concepts are and, and how to program yourself, I would recommend pick a very simple problem. Don't look at open source solutions available already for that. Pick TensorFlow, start programming it. Questions, please. Uh, but AMD's, uh, uh, I have never seen any framework uh, like I can run on AMD's, AMD graphics card, GPUs. Hardware, GPUs, for example, any hardware, even TPUs, Google is coming out of the TPUs. But GPUs, if you say the word GPU, the most famous company is NVIDIA, that's why you'll hear that. Even though Intel, uh, AMD and so many other companies are also coming out with their own custom, even uh, uh, such, such Japanese companies are also coming out with custom GPUs too. But all GPUs are, this hardware is so commoditized, I would not really worry about which company is producing what GPU. If I have availability, accessibility to GPU, I would just run my problem training 
on a GPU. For example, many companies when they do a GPU training, let's say model on a GPU, it's not one or two, it'll be maybe a few tens, maybe a few dozens, maybe a 50 or even 100 or a, a 200 or 500. All are available on the cloud. And if you go to, let's say, Google or if you go to Amazon, uh, if you go to Microsoft Cloud, they just have commoditized GPUs available. So I'm not sure what you're looking for, but if I am doing a machine learning solution and if I'm looking for a GPU, I would just pick something on the cloud and load it there and look at the number of cores available and then train the, uh, create some of the threads and train the model independently. Um, but right now, in terms of hardware progress, NVIDIA is such an advanced stage compared to so many other companies. Intel is actually acquiring so many software companies. Like I said, Neon is a company. It's actually called Nirvana, but they, they acquired. Their product is Neon. They are trying to create custom GPU chips which will have machine learning solutions preloaded and hard-coded so that it is even faster than writing a solution on top of a GPU. But that, those are, that's, that's the research level uh, uh, changes happening at this point of time. For a, for a company like Hexagon, if you're, if you're looking for a solution, we can deploy the, 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 the training and also the solution on the cloud. We can go to Microsoft or we can go to Google, whatever it is. And, and in that case, we can just pick whatever GPU is available. If it's, if it's Google, it can be even TPU too, tensor processing unit. CUDA. CUDA is another framework service. NVIDIA actually came out with a, with a framework called CUDA, which is actually or a framework or a library which is closer to the hardware. Their claim is if you use CUDA defined libraries and some of the deep, deep network uh, uh, libraries are called QDNN. If you use those, those libraries on NVIDIA chips, it becomes even more faster. But again, remember there's actually a constant race going on Intel is coming out with the newer chips now, and at the same time, um, Google TensorFlow and other, other frameworks are coming out with better implementations of the same problem statement. Um, for example, there was a model called RCNN, Region Convolutional Neural Network, proposed in 2016, which localizes an image and detects an image in a, in a still picture. Six months, four months later, another model came called Fast RCNN. Another six months later, another model called Faster RCNN was introduced. There, it's the same chip, but the solution technique was so different, the performance was dramatically higher, maybe even 10 times, 50 times higher. So yes, the hardware level improvements are making some uh, impact on the solution speed, but the techniques that's being implemented every month, every two months I see changes happening. So I said RCNN, fast RCNN, faster RCNN, all happened in 2016, 2017. 2018, I think Feb, March, uh, two new models were introduced called Mask CNN, and I'm forgetting another name. That further took the entire image processing problem statement a, a big massive leap of solving it. Um, I went to meet a startup company when I came last time uh, in, in Technology Hub in the city and heard about it. It's a startup company of six or seven people, people like you. They were developing one single solution and you know what they're developing? In India, we have lots of toll gates. I thought there are only three or type, four types of vehicles, that is a car and a, and a truck and a bus. Apparently, there are at least some 30 to 40 categories of vehicles because every category of vehicle will have a different rate. So if you have, he, the, the, the company guy said, the founder said, if you have a SUV with four doors, but the, the, the back door, which is actually the boot door, if it is open for some reason, 
that would be automatically classified as a different type of car, not an SUV anymore. So this nuances in the definitions in the toll industry in India, there are at least 30 to 40 classes of vehicles. Every vehicle will have a different rate. Now, if it's not automated, because of corruption, you may pay lesser amount and pay for a lesser class, even though you are actually driving a bigger, bigger class vehicle. So government of India and a few other organizations, a few state governments, wanted to develop an automated machine learning based solution which detects the vehicle by looking at the vehicle. Now you think it would be a very simple thing, like the moment you look at the vehicle, it is. But it's not. Let's say if it's a darker time, which it's night, it's early in the morning, it's raining, it's very sun, the sunlight is directly falling onto the camera. The vehicle is not slowing down. What if there's a huge amount of dust on the vehicle? All of these factors will make the model perform lesser. And if it's not accurate, the primary purpose of collecting the right amount of toll is defeated, right? Till 2016, 2017, there were so many models, image processing models that were invented that would take care of high resolution and low resolution images. Images with low light and very high light, that is too much of blurring light. 2008, a new model came out where you can construct a 3D image of a vehicle from multiple 2D pictures. So if you have a vehicle come again, single camera can take, let's say, very quick pictures, like every 100 millisecond it takes a picture. So if you're in one second, you actually have 10 pictures. And using those pictures, you can actually reconstruct a, a 3D image. And the newer model makes a better and a higher accurate prediction on a 3D model than a 2D model. And this company is just developing a solution for that. The moment when I met with them, they were explaining this problem. Last year when they implemented a solution, they really took the state-of-the-art solution available at the time. But now there is a newer solution available, the same hardware, same framework, just the newer techniques of doing it. So there's a constant change happening. And there are simple solutions available, people like you. And if you say, oh, I'm, a, I'm happy with the current job I have, but I really have some free time in the evenings or on the weekends, and I know good programming, send me an email. I'll give you a problem statement and you can start working on it. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, hi. So uh, when you talked about the problem for 9,000 patients and labeling them after five years, whether they are going to be a diabetic uh, patient or not. So when you talk about such a problem where we can use multiple classification algorithm, what do you think, which one we should pick? Uh, because uh, when earlier I uh, tried to implement something uh, on classification, so it was hard to pick which one to, you know, which one to pick. Yeah. Even today, it's hard to pick. Yeah. Like, uh, we should uh, run all the algorithms, or we should figure out, like, how to figure out which one would be better. Sure, yeah. There are multiple answers. I'll give you a long answer. I know it's 3.30 already, and, and it's a good idea to stop, and you may have your meetings and stuff, too. I'll give a quick answer. There are multiple approaches. For example, the first answer is, there is no single answer. You've got to experiment yourself. Number two, that's exactly what you as a machine learning expert would become. If you know once, if you know what the right technique to pick, programming aspect, it becomes almost trivial. If you look at the frameworks, 25 lines of code for semantic anal sentiment analysis, 150 lines of code to do a style transfer, it's almost trivial for programming aspect. But to know which technique to pick, that's where the real talent of a machine learning expert comes in. Number three, even if you're a machine learning expert, sometimes you just can't figure out what's the right technique. In a classical machine learning where 
you have the data and you do a feature engineering. Then you become a domain expert also and then you say, oh, in this example what you gave, I, you are giving the right data like this, you're giving the gender, you're giving the age, you're giving married or not, number of kids, prior diabetic history in the family. Those are all relevant data. The salary the person is making is not a relevant data, right? Now that's very easy for us to figure out. But in a complex situation, let's say if you have, if you have an Alzheimer's patient or if you have an uh, insurance fraud situation, you don't know what factors are influencing insurance fraud and what factors do not influence insurance fraud. And you, do, you, you don't know which features to pick and give to the model. So not knowing the right technique to pick, not knowing the right amount of data that is ra the right features to be given to the model is another complication. And how do we do it? You can, you have to learn a little more, study multiple problem statements and see what people have done, how it has been done, experiment yourself. Sometimes ensemble, it gets, you can pick multiple techniques and see which one is giving a better result. So that means you actually run multiple projects, multiple experiments and figure out. Sometimes after doing three or four or maybe 10 experiments, you would say experiment one, seven, six, three, four, all are doing good. So you actually average them and then it becomes more generalized and then the model, that's called ensemble. You can do that too. There are multiple ways of doing it. The, because machine learning and AI as a knowledge is constantly evolving, there is no standard science, scientific techniques available today. You have a bunch of machine learning techniques available, bunch of techniques how you can do feature engineering, bunch of ways of neural networks to be designed, bunch of ways of hyperparameter setting in the neural, neural networks, different ways of even number of uh, uh, stacks, number of layers of networks you can design. There's so many different things constantly changing. You see a paper today published which actually got a better result in the, using this approach. You have another paper coming out in a month now. So it's constantly changing. There's no st st single standard science. Um, I think over a period of time people are going to pick the, uh, become the right experts to fi figure out. But to answer your question, there's no single uh, way of doing it. You just, I think, by doing constantly things, you would know. Yeah, last question. Uh, two questions. Uh, two questions? Okay. Yeah. There are a lot of uh, two questions. One is where do we get the free data set? Second is uh, how do we pre-process the data? Uh, there are a lot of online sites available and I do have links and I can send it to you what those links are but if you give it a Google search you'll find a lot of places where you're getting free data sets. Pre-processing is extremely important. Um, even if you give the data to neural networks where people believe you don't need to do any more pre-processing, you don't need to uh, do feature engineering for neural networks, you still have to do a little bit of a cleaning up of the data. Uh, those are nothing else but the pure statistical techniques which you will follow. Uh, then that is, if you're an ML expert and a domain expert, you would know what type of processing that need to be done. Uh, for example, if you have, uh, uh, in, in a patient data in this case, uh, we talked about, let's say gender data, gender data was also given. So you have male and female, but age is a number, male and female is, is, a, is a text, is, is an alphabet. How would you normalize this, how would you convert that into numeric data, number one, and how would you normalize the data? So you actually say, oh, male will be M1 uh, uh, and female will be two or whatever, or minus one, one, whatever. So that type of ma statistical techniques need to be applied. So the, I don't think they can give a generic answer, but there's a lot of pre-processing is to be done. Actually, I believe in a six months of AI project, uh, four to four and a half months is spent only on data cleaning up, data pre-processing, data upgrades. The actual model designing, model, model architecture, training, etc., would be not that much. Okay, that's it, guys, for today. And I'll see you guys tomorrow if you're interested. Uh, I'll talk about text, text summarization tomorrow. Thank you.